So this is a discussion on energy storage materials for the impact of materials on society. Um, and specifically, this talk will be concerned with lithium-ion batteries. So a lithium-ion battery is a means in which you can store electrical energy and deliver it to you when you need it. Uh, the materials involved in a lithium-ion battery uh, include lithium, which is the ion that conducts the, uh, across the electrolyte from the anode to the cathode while you're using your battery. Um, in, in a charged state, the anode is, is typically graphite or graphene structure in which lithium ions are stored inside of there. Uh, when you go to discharge your battery, those lithium ions will then go into an electrolyte, and in the middle of the electrolyte is a separator that keeps the anode and cathode from touching each other. The lithium ions are positively charged, and they flow over into the cathode and get stored inside of materials like lithium cobalt oxide and lithium manganese oxide. And in doing so, they need to be joined up with the electrons they lost. Those electrons go through a circuit, which then passes through, say, your cell phone, and then goes back into the cathode at where they recombine with the lithium, and the lithium is reduced. So in this way, you can actually generate an electrical current in a mobile device. The lithium-ion battery was first proposed back in the 1970s by Stan Whittingham. However, it was not really enabled until the 80s. The first thing that happened was the concept of a reversible intercalation graphite for the anode. And that means you could stuff the anode with lithium inside of it and then remove it, sort of in, like in interstitial positions. Um, and that was a very important invention from the anode side. And then, of course, the other side is the cathode, and you have to have both to make a battery work. And in this case, there was a reversible intercalation oxide for the cathodes uh, that were discovered in the 70s. Um, the switch from a lithium metal to lithium ion made the batteries much safer. Uh, the original concept was to use metallic lithium as the anode. However, that is a very reactive metal. And by using the lithium stored inside of the graphite instead, you now create what's called a lithium ion battery. And that was much safer. Um, and then finally, uh, coming up with something that was a stable cathode and air was critical because you needed to be able to do industrial scale production without everything having to be in a glove box. And that was enabled by the discovery of lithium cobalt oxide in 1985. So the next question is, why should I care about batteries in general. Well, as we know, there's a big push right now for electrical vehicles. Um, the electric vehicle market is huge primarily for several reasons. One is, is we want to decrease our dependence on oil and gasoline. We would also like to reduce the greenhouse gases and pollution. And so there is a big push to try to figure out how you can electrify vehicles. And of course, that means you're going to have to have huge batteries in these vehicles. And of course, also, there's the challenge of making sure the batteries last long enough for you to get to your destination and back again. Um, and finally, you want to make sure that you can charge your battery fast enough so that you're not sitting at a gas station or an electric vehicle charging station for hours waiting for your car to get recharged. Uh, the same thing is true with cell phones and laptops. We've become a very mobile society, and batteries basically enable us to have lots and lots of functionality in these devices. And, and if you start, anybody who's ever turned on lots and lots of apps on an iPhone will realize that the battery life is compromised very rapidly due to this uh, lack of, uh, I mean, due to the absorption of energy by the apps. So, so if we want to continue to increase the functionality of our cell phones, we need to get better batteries. Finally, there's the challenge of grid storage. There's a lot of interest in using renewable energy supplies, such as wind and solar, um, for uh, creating a grid energy supply. That's where you plug in your television set and everything else. However, the challenge there is, is that you get a lot of fluctuations. The wind doesn't always blow at the same rate. And these fluctuations are a challenge for the power company, which must provide the same amount of power at all times. And so, the battery is a backup mechanism whereby when the wind stops blowing, the battery can start 
providing electricity until the wind starts blowing again. So they use this thing for what's called load leveling. So again, batteries influence you on several areas. So why lithium-ion batteries? Um, there's lots of batteries out on the market, and uh, nickel-cadmium batteries and nickel-metal hydride batteries. And so why the lithium-ion? Well, lithium is a very light material, which means it has a very high specific energy, meaning the amount of energy you can get out per kilogram is very high. It also has very high open circuit voltage, which means that if you want to operate with lots of power at very low currents, then, then the higher voltage is important. Um, it has less, much less memory effect. Uh, anybody who's ever had a razor or a power drill that no longer holds a charge very long or a cell phone that doesn't hold a very, charge very long understands the challenge of what's called a memory effect where the uh, nickel cadmium batteries, for example, will, will suffer uh, a loss with time in their energy storage capabilities. And finally, they have a longer shelf life so that you can have older batteries and they will still work. So they sit on the shelf much longer. However, the disadvantage with lithium-ion batteries is that you're using a very flammable liquid, and sometimes this can be uh, quite explosive, as you see in the picture on the right. So there's a concern with safety uh, with these um, high-power uh, uh, cathodes and anodes next to liquid, the liquids that are flammable. There's also a limited cell life in the sense that you form a layer of material inside the, inside the cathode and anode that can break off and, and slowly degrade the capacity of your battery so that, that after 500 or 1,000 cycles, your battery no longer stores the same amount of energy as it used to. And then there's also concern of how well your battery functions with changes in temperature, and lithium-ion batteries suffer some uh, decrease in performance with increased temperature. So what properties make lithium-ion batteries so attractive? Well, in this graph, you can see that there's two things you would want out of a battery. One thing is the x-axis, which is how far can I go? How long will my battery last? And, um, and so you want the highest specific energy possible. And you can see that when you move from lead acid over to lithium metal or lithium-ion, that the specific energy increases dramatically. The second thing you're interested in is power. In other words, how much current can I get out? And you don't want to, you want to be able to ex think of that as the acceleration in your electric vehicle. And so, again, lithium ion has got much higher specific power than lead acid or nickel cadmium batteries. And so, so this is what's making the lithium ion battery so attractive for applications ranging from, like I said, anything from electric vehicles through personal mobility devices. The forecasted market for lithium-ion batteries is expected to double to increase anywhere from doubling to a factor of five over the next 10 years. So there's a lot of people that are believing the lithium-ion battery market is a huge market, and this is ostensibly because of the electric vehicle and the penetration of electric vehicles into the autom automotive market. So. Um, there's an awful lot of interest in seeing this come to fruition in the future. So, the next question is, what is the size effect? In material science, we work very hard to try to understand what is the effect of size. Um, and in batteries, is no different. There is a um, an interest in seeing high-powered batteries and these high power batteries are enabled by nanoparticles because nanoparticles, um, in the case of lithium iron phosphate, uh, enable you to have lots more reaction sites. And if I can have more reaction sites, then I can actually get my lithium to those reaction sites faster and have them all react at once. And A123 was famous for using nanoparticles to increase the, uh, the power of their cathodes. Uh, nanowires are also being explored for higher capacity. In this case, uh, nanowires of semiconductors like silicon and germanium are very interesting materials because they offer the ability to take advantage of the huge capacities uh, afforded by silicon and germanium. And these materials are called conversion 
materials. And the conversion cathode or the conversion anode in the case of silicon and germanium, the challenge is, is that when you convert something like silicon to a, a material that is very rich in lithium, it swells dramatically. And so how do you accommodate the stress? And people are very interested in using nanowires because they can expand and accommodate the stress much more readily than, say, a solid film of silicon can. And finally, people are interested in nanoporous metals because, again, if you can put your cathode or anode materials inside of a porous metal, that means that you have a lot shorter distances that the electrons have to transfer now to, uh, and, and you can get much higher capacities or much higher powers out of your batteries. So nanomaterials have a bright future in terms of battery applications. What are the key material challenges? Well, there's lots of challenges from the material standpoint. Uh, as I've said, you want to improve the capacity. Everybody wants their batteries to last longer. You would like to be able to charge your cell phone once a week rather than once every day. Uh, you would like to also be able to drive 300 miles instead of 30 miles in your electric vehicle. You also want to improve the cycle rate, how fast they recharge. And so nanostructured materials are enabling you to do that. Um, and that's, they're being investigated to help improve cycle rate. Uh, and again, this is obviously important from the standpoint of if you have an electric vehicle, how long do you stand at the charging station before you can start driving again? Um, you want to improve the power, so how fast they discharge, again, from an acceleration standpoint. And again, nanostructured materials are offering you options in that arena. You want to improve the cycling. Um, ideally, you don't want to have to replace all the battery pack in your electric vehicle or your cell phone every two years, but you'd like to have it charge up for maybe 5,000 times instead of 500 times before it starts uh, seeing a reduction in its capacity. And so in that sense, what you have to do is reduce the side reactions. Um, and then finally, you'd like to improve the safety, of course, and that means going to either non-flammable electrolytes or reduced flammable electrolytes um, or other systems which basically keep this, the battery from uh, overheating and going into an explosive condition. So these are all materials challenges that material scientists are trying to address right now. What about usage? Well, there's a lot of environmental impact questions on the fabrication and disposal. There's questions about mining lithium, where is there enough lithium in the world to satisfy all the lithium ion batteries that everybody wants to build? Um, it turns out that there are very vast lithium salt lakes in Bolivia, uh, and so this is a very promising source of lithium, but there's lithium supplies around the world. There's also questions about sustainability. Do we have enough cobalt and manganese for all of the cathodes? And so you have to worry about how you're going to build a battery that can be recycled so that, that when it does use up its life, you can, you can extract those uh, transition metals back out again and reuse them again. And then the ethical and social implications for the future. Um, this raises some very interesting questions that we will have to figure out, including how to improve batteries influence the future society. Um, as we become more and more mobile, and we depend more and more on portable devices uh, because of the ability of the battery to handle more applications, uh, what does that do to us as a society? Do we become uh, less integrated or more integrated? Um, with Facebook and all of the other social media, everyone now is very connected to other, everybody else, but it's interesting to note that there seems to be fewer close friends and more casual friends. And so as a society, we're evolving, and a lot of this evolution of the society is dependent upon uh, technology such as batteries. Um, so are we becoming more globally aware is another good question. Uh, we're obviously always connected, and so people now can understand what's going on in other countries and re react to it much quicker. So all of these things have to be explored further as you try to understand the impact of materials on society, especially with respect to battery applications.